Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is our debut show. This is our very first show, and I've got some great guests for you. We're going to have uh, a good time talking about some really, really important topics. Now, if you are a uh, fan of News Talk 870 and you tune in every day at noon and you're expecting to hear Sean Hannity, I gotta tell you, I'm sorry, he's not on right now. <laughs> I'm on, and my name is Christine Brown. But Sean Hannity is gonna be on from one to four mm -hmm. every weekday. Yes. So you'll be able to see him then. Don't you think, uh, John McKay? Absolutely, yeah. and then All right. we'll follow with uh, Mark Levin after that. It's uh, from four to seven, and Michael Savage from seven to 10. All right. So. Sean Hannity is on, one to four. All right, so I'm sure you're sitting out there and you're thinking, what are we going to do for an hour? Well, I'll tell you. We're going to have some guests in the studio and on the phone. We're going to take your phone calls to add some comments or questions to whatever our topic is. We're going to cover all kinds of topics. We're going to do topics that make us think or laugh. Maybe we're going to cry. We might even get kind of mad. But you know what? We're going to maintain civility through the whole thing. And the, the beauty of this is that I am queen. I am queen <laughs> for a day. I am queen. And if you are not civil, I will punch you out by punching the line and disconnecting you. That's a uh, nice queen. That's uh, am I? We'll see. <laughs> so, all right. What's in a name? Meet in the Middle with Christine Brown. I chose it. I chose it very purposefully. Um, I'm not alone. I think a lot of you feel the same way. We have watched, all of us, we've watched what happened, what happens to our country in two decades worth of creating polar opposites in this country. And we get nothing done. That's the bottom line. We've got some big issues out there. We've got big issues like immigration, tax reform, education standards, election reform, Wall Street reform. They're just <coughs> sitting there and they're not getting addressed. We can't blame politicians anymore. I mean, that's, a, that's easy to blame them, but quite frankly, politicians and what have is a reflection of us, you and me, you and me. Our new words are gonna be compromise, collaborate, and cooperate. And I know, I know, some of you out there are thinking, hey, that woman's pretty naive, isn't she? <laughs> but um, I, don't, I don't think I am. Nothing is going to change until we start that. And I know I'm not alone. So from this point on, we're going to start that. We're going to meet in the middle, and from the middle, you can see both sides. That's the unique part of it. So that's how we're going to approach some of our discussions. Now, um, we're going to talk about police practices today. That's my very first topic, and I've invited a couple of people in to share <coughs> information about that. But very first thing, before we launch off into that, I want to talk about the breaking news of what happened today. Yes. In the studio, we have Kennewick Police Chief Ken Hohenberg. And Ken, there was a, a major breaking news event that happened this morning. Tell us what went on. Well, real quickly, um, our officers responded to a disturbance. And uh, originally, when the call came in early this morning, the mother of the suspect called stating she was worried about her son was going to harm himself or someone else. Uh, ultimately, the officers ended up in Kennewick, uh, 3320 West 9th Avenue, um, where originally when they knocked on the door and a female answered the door, uh, she said that everything was okay and they didn't need to be there. However, ultimately what the officers heard was arguing um, and it was loud arguing and screaming to the point where, uh, under the circumstances, they felt like they needed to enter the apartment. When they attempted to breach a door and go inside, um, the suspect at that time told them that he was armed with a weapon and he was going to kill the officers. So it was uh, started early this morning, and um, I think I was called. I got up Monday mornings. I go to roll call at six o'clock, so I was up at four fifteen when. I received the original call and uh, ultimately we were able to, uh, there were three people inside the apartment, uh, two females and a child and the officers were able to uh, get the child and the mother out of the apartment initially. Matter of fact, two of our officers from Kennewick ended up uh, covering the mother after she dropped from the second floor balcony to the officers and the suspect came out with a firearm, uh, fired at our officers, and uh, 
two other officers, one from Richland, one from Benton County Sheriff's Department, returned fire. Ultimately, the suspect was wounded and um, refused to come out, and we had paramedics standing by, certainly tried to get him medical aid, uh, sent our robot in that we have uh, as a result of community donations from Happel and Windermere and Tri-Cities, and he was armed with a handgun and a, and a long rifle, and ultimately uh, he passed away. One of the things I heard, Chief, is that um, the robot actually took the, uh, made sure that he didn't have the handgun, or didn't have a gun. The robot moved it? Ultimately, yes. Um, wow. He, um, you know, he confronted the robot. I'm not sure exactly what was going on in his thought process, but we were able to see movement, and we were trying to get him medical aid, but uh, he stayed focused on on uh, preventing us from coming inside the apartment. And ultimately, after there was no movement in the apartment, the robot was actually able to grab a hold of the weapon and move it away from him so that we could enter the apartment safely. Wow, that's pretty amazing right there. So the bottom line is that the suspect is dead, two adult women are safe, one child, I believe the child is seven years old, that's is safe, correct. no officers were injured, correct? correct? The other amazing thing out of this story is that officers are laying on top of this woman to protect her from getting hit with bullets. That's just incredible. It is incredible. It, it was very heroic on, on the officer's part. It was very heroic on the uh, part of the Richland police officer and the Benton County Sheriff's deputy. You have limited resources when uh, you have a dynamic situation that is quickly unfolding. and. Um, as a result of the collaboration and partnership throughout the Tri-Cities, uh, Richland and Benton County responded over to assist us because of the limited resources. And because we do training together, regional training together as well, uh, it was very transparent. Even though you had officers from different agencies, our training is so similar that when it comes to uh, the command and control and, and being able to cover each other, it was seamless. And ultimately, as you mentioned, uh, two adult females and a child uh, were recovered. <clears throat> All right, that's great. So glad that you could be here today to talk about that, uh, Chief. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so we move into our next topic. We're going to set that aside, and I want to. I want to. You know, it's on the mind of so many people across this country, and that has <clears throat> to do with uh, the practices of police today. And it feels like uh, I'm not going to go through the litany of cases that have to do with. Uh, people being shot, killed, beat up, whatever. Um, but it, it uh, I feel like 10 years ago we didn't hear about this. Um, and so I want to know, first of all, I want us to explore what's different, why has this changed? And let me also bring in our second guest here, and that's Rick Rios. And um, Rick is with Consejo Latino here in the Tri-Cities area. They, are, uh, they champion economic development for Hispanic business <coughs> owners. They try to develop cross-cultural understanding. And uh, they've been pretty involved in um, making sure that the Pasco shooting that happened in February is still top of mind. I want to tell everybody that we're not going to talk about the Pasco shooting per se because it's still under investigation. But I invited Rick here because I really wanted that perspective from the largest minority group in the Tri-Cities, which is Latino. So, gentlemen, let's start with Rick, since we've just heard quite a bit here from the Chief. Rick, what's changed? Why are we seeing all this? Well, we're seeing all this, Christine, because of the proliferation of smart devices and handheld cameras. Smartphones. Uh, everybody's got one. Uh, you start seeing more and more of uh, virtually everything that's happening all around us because people are aware that if you just turn <coughs> a look and focus for a minute, you're probably going to see something happen. And with the police scenario, inevitably, if you see police interacting with people, there's a chance that there's law enforcement going on. And so everybody wants to make sure that let's capture this. Let's see what's going to happen because these moments can turn volatile in an instant. And I heard that is a mentality that exists out there. Yeah, so Rick, it's your opinion that this has always been going on and we've just never <coughs> seen it recorded? Yeah, I think that the average person would say, yeah, 
this isn't something that just started happening 10 years ago. Uh, I, when I sit and talk to people about this, I always go back to the North Hollywood shootout in the late 90s, 1997, <coughs> when police departments throughout the entire United States looked at that scenario and said, as uh, the, the skipper in Jaws said, we need a bigger boat. The police looked at that scenario and said, hey, we need to have guns at least as good as their guns. And so you saw an escalation in police departments saying, we got to prepare ourselves because the bad guys also got a blueprint and the blueprint was we have access to bigger and better weapons than the police do. Yeah. And so just like you see in every other aspect of civilization, an arms race developed. And as soon as the arms race developed, then you created an us against them mentality. You can't arm yourself and prepare yourself with war without letting the public know we're ready for war. Bring it on. Mm -hmm. And so that's a mentality that exists. And you have to look at it from the police side and say, we need to protect our officers. But at what cost? At what point does the protection of the police officer infringe on the public's right to be able to trust the police officer? Yeah. Chief, what do you think has happened? What do you think is different from 10 years ago? How do you see that? Well, um, you know, as I look back over my career and most people know that I've been here for a long time. I started with Kennewick in 1978, so I'm finishing up 37 years of policing in the Tri-Cities, and certainly, you know, technology has played a huge part in capturing things on video, whether it's the police or other incidents. Uh, I've told a lot of people, you know, going back to Candid Camera and America's Funniest Videos, which oftentimes I don't find too funny when people get hurt and mm -hmm. somebody captures that on camera, but uh, the reality of it is that technology is out there. Um, but what I have seen, going back over my tenure as chief over the last 12 years with the Kennewick Police Department, we didn't have the gang violence that we currently do in the Tri-Cities and throughout the state of Washington. Uh, it's been around for a long, long time, but in our area, we didn't have the amount of violence. You know. The other thing is people arming themselves. Uh, when I started, it was very uncommon in 1978, the early 80s, to, have, to come upon somebody that had a firearm that was threatening either uh, another person or certainly the police when we would arrive with a firearm. We did have those occasionally, but we, we did not come on, uh, on a routine basis like we do now. I mean, the, the other thing that I think uh, we see a lot of times, we talk about community trust, we capitalize on, on the high profile where somebody is shot, somebody shot and killed, whatever the circumstances may be. But the reality is across America every day, there's hundreds of incidents where police officers go to a situation that has the potential of being a lethal encounter with law enforcement and we're able to resolve those successfully. Just like this morning in the incident that we had this morning, we tried to resolve that. Um, we tried to get the person medical aid. We had paramedics standing by, uh, but unfortunately, in order to keep people safe, there is that balance. And um, when I started, there was no SWAT teams. And I think as Rick pointed out, the Hollywood shootout was one where the police were outgunned. I, they had to go to a sporting goods store to get more ammunition, get more firearms. And I think it's incumbent upon law enforcement across the country, We are one of our core duties, one of our core missions is to help people. And we have to find ways to empower our police officers to, to do good in our community. And, and that's one of the things over the last 12 years, whether it's Special Olympics or most recently with our community care program, it's finding ways to interact and be engaged with the community on a day-to-day -day basis. So not the only time that you see a police officer interacting with somebody, it shouldn't be the law enforcement component because more often than not, we're helping people. We get called uh, more often than not because somebody needs help and we provide help. More importantly, oftentimes we provide hope. Yeah. You know what? I want to talk about what are we going to do in the future. And we're going to take a break now. We also want to make sure that maybe we can try to include some of your calls. So why don't you think about giving us a call? Our phone number is... What? I, I'm just new here, people. <laughs> Our phone number is 509-547-8726. We're back in a moment. 
your first question, and it had to do to make sure that it was constitutionally protected, the answer to that is yes. Um, hey, what is Stingray technology? I'm sorry, I have and, no idea. And I guess I should have clarified yeah. that, Tim. I assume you're talking about the cell phone technology. He's gone. Yes, yeah, he's talking okay. about cell phone technology and tracking information oh, I see. that law enforcement okay. does. And, and, and that's, that's an easy one for me. Um, all, you know, in 1978, I, I took an oath to uphold the Constitution, and it's, it's whether it comes to people's constitutional rights, uh, the right for people to, to gather and to demonstrate. Um, we work very hard to live up to our motto of committed to your safety. I appreciate the fact that he supports local law enforcement. Uh, the reality of it is when he talks about there's a lot of new police cars out there. In Kennewick, we, we don't have individual take-home cars. We have a fleet. So we replaced the fleet at one time, and what he has saw is the replacement of the fleet here about a year ago. And the reality of it is that fleet will last for about five years. And um, so, you know, one of our core values in the city of Kennewick is stewardship. So we work very, very hard to maximize um, our resources that the public can trust us to have. And I guess the last thing that I would say when we talk about support on the law enforcement side of the Benton County River, uh, as most of you know, that uh, last August the voters in Benton County passed the public safety sales tax to help provide additional resources. Now, the additional resources, you're never going to have enough people. They cost money. Uh, it's an ongoing expense. And if you look across the country, and certainly the state of Washington is at the very bottom when it comes uh, to officers per thousand ratio, and uh, that's one measurement, but we're at the very low end of that across the country. Um, we, we are very lean as you look throughout the state of Washington on how many police officers we have policing our communities. But with this new tax, you're going to be adding 12 people. Isn't that correct? That is correct. Yeah. How do you think um, a lot of the recent activity is going to affect your ability to hire those 12 people? I already know, I've already heard you talk before about the difficulty of finding enough qualified um, candidates who are interested in this job. And it's a pretty good paying job. It's a good well, career. It's a great career. Yeah. And it's not just enough qualified candidates. It's the right candidates. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the type of people that we want to police our communities, people that I want to have interact with my family or my friends or the people that I've taken the oath uh, to uphold the law here in the city of Kennewick. And I reflect back to uh, what we do here in the Tri-Cities. You know, from our perspective, when I started in 1978, I think Kennewick dealt with Kennewick issues, Richland dealt with Richland issues. Today, what we do in Kennewick, we realize has an impact on the Tri-Cities as a whole. So if I put somebody on a federal task force like the U.S. Marshals Fugitive Apprehension Team, um, I'm helping the Tri-Cities as a whole, not just Kennewick. Rick, I want to turn to you because I specifically asked you to come here today because I really wanted a voice from what would be the largest minority group in our area and certainly in Franklin County, we can't even call it a minority group anymore. Um, in terms of sheer numbers, it's nearly 60% of the population Correct. is uh, Hispanic background. But their voice has not been um, a majority. Certainly their voice has been... Um,